happy second Sunday of October. There is no frost on the pumpkin. Would you stand with me, please? And turn to hymn number 335 in your hymnals. We will sing together and rejoice in the music.
Would you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Ephesians? What a wonderful, wonderful book filled with just um, wonderful things. We, we, uh, we're going to try to cover the entire book today. Um, it doesn't really do justice. There's so many topics we can talk about. Uh, and I know I, I've said that a lot as we move through some of these books. Um, keep in mind that Ephesians and Philippians and some of these other letters were actually meant to be uh, read in a sitting. So um, it, when they, uh, we'll talk about where this was set, but when, when they gathered together and they read, they said, here we have a letter from Paul, and we're going to read it. They would have read it. They would have, they would have just read it. And whether they ask questions after or not, we, you know, we don't we don't really know that we don't have um, at least a scriptural reference to what form uh, that took or what that looked like. But um, uh, we we don't have. I guess what I'm trying to say is we don't have to get into every word and parse every thought and meaning in order to have an understanding. Of what's going on. We can sit down and read this and come away from it richer because we've been involved in God's Word. I want to talk to you today about a walk in a mystery, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about that uh, in just a minute. Let me begin by just taking us to chapter 1, and let's read a few verses, and please follow along. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about that, but I want to just kind of read some of this to give you a flavor of what was going on here. So, firstly, we have this greeting from Paul to the people in Ephesus, and uh, to the saints in Ephesus, actually. Obviously, it's written to the church. Keep, it, keep that in mind as you read through the, the New Testament, especially from um, Romans on. The Gospels were uh, narratives uh, or historical. The book of Acts is obviously uh, historical. It's an account of what happened. When we get into these epistles, from Romans on through, um, perhaps you could even include the book of the Revelation. You have letters that are written to believers. So keep in mind, there's, there's wisdom here for everybody 
the plan of salvation is laid out here for everyone. But these were letters that were written to believers. And we'll talk a little, a little bit more about that in 10. Anyway, we don't, we don't know exactly. The form of this is a little bit different, so we don't know exactly to whom this was written. We know it was written to the believers in Ephesus. Because of the general form of the way this thing starts, it's very possible that this was intentionally meant to be passed around, and so it didn't have any personal greetings or things like that that some of the other letters the apostle had. Now, if you read Acts chapter 19, you'll read about Paul in, in Ephesus. And we're going to take time to go through all that. You can look at it and, and see that it's there. You see that he's three, he goes there, and he's three months in the synagogue, and he presents the gospel uh, that Jesus was the Messiah in the synagogue for three months. So we, you know, we, we kind of expect that that was probably the Sabbath day for, for three months. Don't we know for sure what that looked like either. And then he said they rejected him and he left and he took the gospel to the Gentiles who were there. Uh, Rome was a capital, uh, excuse me, Ephesus was the capital city of the province. It's a huge, important Roman city. He went to the Gentiles and he was there for two years. Uh, until they chased him out. And you also read in Acts 19 that when Paul returned, was on his journey to return to Jerusalem, where he knew he would be arrested, that he called for the elders of the church at Ephesus. And they met in a, in a city along the way. He said, and in Acts, Scripture actually says Paul didn't want to go to Ephesus. But he called the elders together. And you read that and you'll you'll see there's wonderful advice he gives those people. So he was two years. He left because there was a great conflict <clears throat> with a labor union. They didn't call it that then. They called it a guild. And it was the guild of the silversmiths. And the reason that they had a great <clears throat> uh, conflict was because Paul was preaching that there's only one God. And the one God has a son who was both God and man, and that's where your worship go, and so the silversmiths were upset because the temple of Diana was in Ephesus, and it was one of the one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so the silversmiths you know, you read all this in Acts chapter 19, they got frustrated because Paul was ruining their living. And people were not buying I mean, if, you know, if you were there, you had to have one of these in your house. And, if, you know, if you didn't have any money, you went out and got a stick and you carved your own. You know, it would be terrible if I had to do that. I mean, I, I just try to leave a stick, leave it as a stick and put Sharpie marks on it. Because I can't carve anything. All right? Even the Sharpie marks would be ugly. At any rate, if you were poor, you had a, a, a cheap one. If you were wealthy, you had an expensive one. And these people were making money on this. So... Uh, folks, there's always three main areas of conflict. Uh, power, which is control, sex, and money. Those are the three main areas that cause conflict among all sorts of people and all sorts of relationships on all sorts of levels. And we can we can delve into that. We won't get into it. If, if, uh, if you have power, you can probably get sex and money. If you have enough money, you can get sex and power. If you're a, if you're a female and you're willing to use your sex, you can probably get power and money. Okay, and uh, if you're old enough to have seen any movies, <laughs> okay, any movies, all right, because the movie is basically, except for you know, absolute. Stupid ones like Dumb and Dumber. But, it, it, yes, I'm a movie critic in my other life, so I just don't know. Uh, but, but any movie, any novel, there's got to be, you know, to make this thing work, there's got to be some conflict, doesn't there? And what's the conflict going to be about? It's going to be about money, sex, and power. So, you know, uh, don't be thinking that this conflict between the gospel slash righteousness and money is something new. It's not. The Apostle Paul dealt with it. They said, you know, you can't keep preaching this stuff 
<clears throat> not because you're violating our spiritual, you know, uh, uh, reality, which they did in Jerusalem. And why was that bothering them? Because they had control, right? So these people are saying, look, you're violating our, you're hurting our income, and you can't, you can't do that. This is nothing new. It doesn't matter. You, just, you know, what's the old saying? Follow the money. Whether it's abortion or vaccines, uh, people are being controlled by money, either through rewards and incentives or by fees and taxes and restrictions. So much so that when we get to the end of this book, all right, and it talks about the mark of the beast. What does the mark of the beast allow you to do? Buy and sell. Say, well, that's not important. Well, it is if you're hungry. You know, unless you've got a cattle ranch in your backyard, and you're going to want to, you're going to have to buy something. So it's that it's always there. There's nothing new. This book was probably written from Paul's house arrest in Rome. Remember we said he said goodbye to the elders there and then he went on to Jerusalem where he got into a, a, a tiff and kind of put it mildly, got into a tiff. They were going to kill him. He was taken away to Caesarea. He was in prison for a few years actually there before they finally sent him to Rome and he was there in Rome. He was there in Rome for approximately two years in house arrest where we re will read it next week as we read Philippians <clears throat> that the, because of that, the gospel went through the entire royal palace guard because they were guarding Paul. Very interesting. So, Paul begins, and, and I read to you already verses 3 through 14. Paul begins by laying the foundation for life and living. And when we look at the book of Ephesians, as some of other, Paul's other books, we find that the beginning chapters talk about what God has done. And the ending cha chapters talk about what we are to do. So chapters 1 through 3 say here's what God has done. And then the book of Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6 tell us what we are to do. Let me read to you the beginning of chapter 4. And we can't get into all the details of this. But um, he ends chapter 3 um, with the word Amen. Interestingly enough. And then in chapter 4 he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called, one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, etc. And he goes on to talk, and we'll maybe talk more about that a little bit later. <clears throat> so he, he uses the word therefore. He gives chapter 3, here's, how you're, here's, what, here's all the things that God has done. And I, uh, well, we're going to look at some of them just briefly. But here's all the things that God has done. And he says, now, therefore, because of that, here's what you are to do. And he gives us all sorts of instructions, uh, which we'll talk about. Now, there are some themes and truths here. And um, one of them, one of the themes is Paul's descriptive words regarding the church. So I, I encourage you to kind of notice these if you read, and if you didn't notice them, go back and, and reread this. It doesn't, it, it doesn't take more than 15 or 20 minutes to read this whole book. Um, you know, unless you start making notes and run references and doing other things. Um, um, I want you to think as you read this, especially the, the chapters 4, 5, and 6. Does Paul write those things for a gathering like today? Or for every day. Let me let me let me just read to you a, a couple of verses from, from chapter five, and then you, you kind of think about it. Um, verse fifteen. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, 
but as wise, making the best use of its time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to, to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, what do you think? Are those verses written for a formal gathering when the believers met like we're doing today? Or was it written for their everyday life? You guys got to speak up. You got to make yourself heard. Every day. Every day. All right. Written for every day. So keep that in mind. There are only a couple of passages in the entire list of the epistles that have to do with what goes on in a meeting. You'll see them because they're obvious. That uh, because they're they're specified. And this, of course, we use this. We encourage you each week to come and bring something because you know, we're we're challenged in Scripture to bring a hymn or a song or a spiritual song. We're challenged in Scripture to bring things which, which edify and exhort and comfort. So we encourage you later on. We have a show time. And we ask you, what's God done for you? What can you? What's God done for you this past week? What can you share with us that will be a blessing to other people? So when we gather together, what we do on a regular basis ought to be easier when we're all in a, when we're in together in a supporting environment where we all are believing the same thing and have the same set of I can use the term core values. We, we've got to be careful about zeroing in on Scripture and, and uh, taking specific things out of context. I mean, otherwise, we can say, yes, that that's hymns. Uh, folks, churches say they sing hymns because it says so here. Okay? And that's okay. But that's a pretty narrow definition. And if I'm following that definition, the only time I'm not allowed to get drunk is on Sunday morning when I'm in church. Are you following this? Yeah. It's just common. If you, if you read this and you have common sense. I don't know why when we read the Bible, we throw all the rules of understanding what's being read out the window and say, oh, I'll just make up my own rules. Hmm. So, we got to be careful. We don't have too narrow under understanding of that. So those are just kind of some general things. Now let's just talk about some of the words that Paul used. I'm going to read to you just a, or give you some notes here. It says the church is central to God's purpose in the world because it is a sign of the final reconciliation of all things in Christ. And then here are some tenets that Paul uses as he moves through the book. The church is God's possession colony which the Lord of history has begun to fashion the renewed humanity after his image. And I you can find that in 1, 10 through 14, 2, 11 through 22, 3, 6 through 9, 3, 6, 9 through 11, and 4, 1 through 6, 9. We've got a whole, you know, 4, 1 through the whole, almost the whole chapter. Secondly, the church is a community where God's power to reconcile people to himself is his experienced and shared in transformed relationships. Interesting. Now, is that church something that happens here and here alone? Or is that church something that happens wherever we are? Wherever we are, right? Not just in a meeting. So keep that in mind. His church is a new temple a building of people grounded in the sure revelation of what God has done in his history. And I don't know if you noticed it, but when I read those first few verses of chapter 1, all of this stuff was in past tense. Let me read just a couple sentences. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has 
blessed us. That's past tense, isn't it? With every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us. It doesn't say he's choosing. It says he chose. That's past tense. And to go on, it says, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm going to stop there reading. By the way, if you want an interesting study, go through there and mark all the places where it says, in him. In him. In him. Over and over and over again. We'll look at some more of the words that Paul used in just a minute. So, a building, a people grounded in sure revelation of what God has done. Past tense. Uh, the fourth thing, the church is an organism. And then there's two parts to this. One, in where power and authority are exercised after the pattern of Christ. And its stewardship is a means of serving God. Him. So there's two, two parts. One is power and authorities here. And second, in, in the church, is power and authorities in the church. Now, again, not in the meeting. Christianity's ruined itself by defining its existence as a meeting. Christianity is not a meeting. Christians come to a meeting. Everybody smile. How many heard this before? How many are awake? Okay, six people. All right, good. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, Christians sing songs. Christianity is not a song. Okay? So the church, is, the church has ruined itself by defining Christianity as a meeting. And the reason it's done that, and I, uh, uh, I'll complete this loop and I'll try to get out of it. Right the reason it's done it is because it wants power or control. And if we get that out of our thinking that what I do for God, I do on a Sunday morning. And when I live for God, I do it on a Sunday morning. And when I encourage people, I do it. If we get, if we get that out of our thinking and, and instead replace it with the thought that I'm a, that I'm a child of God, all 168 hours of the week and that I walk before him every day, 24-7, and the Holy Spirit dwells within me as a believer, past tense, all this stuff that, as a believer, it's all done, and the Holy Spirit dwells within me as a believer every day, every moment, every hour, and that these things that we, especially when we read in chapters 4, 5, and 6 are things that are to be done, that it can be done by God through me in my life out here that I can sing songs and bring hymns and bring encouragement and bring a blessing and that I can live righteously and I can be filled with the Holy Spirit and I can put on the armor of God. All right. Number four, church is an organism in which power and authority are exercised after the pattern of Christ. I think I said that already. Number, uh, number five, and it's stewardship, I already said that. Number five, the church is an outpost in a dark world. Wow. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13 and says, uh, these three things abide. Anybody remember what they are? And what's the greatest? Love. Jesus said, all men will know you're my disciples if you what? Uh, if you go to church on Sunday morning, put a bumper sticker on your car, right? Give a tithe. Well, I'm not hearing you guys answer anything. If you love one another, in this dark world needs love. Talk about that another time. To talk about feelings. Love is. <laughs> you know, earlier we said a Christian can sing, but Christianity is not a song. Um, love can bring feelings, but love is not a feeling. Love is a commitment before God to do what's best. For somebody else. And what's best for somebody else is to help draw them closer to the Lord. 
Um, and then finally, the church is a bride, preparing for the approach of her lover and husband. Six things that Paul talks about it in Ephesians to get us to see, folks, we're, we're not we're not connected to some little fringe parochial group that has no, uh, you know, it's our life and death and then it's gone. It's our little building and then it's over with and it's our little practices and it's done. The Apostle Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago and it's still true. And if the, if the Lord tears another 2,000 years, it will be true all that time. And it will still be the Lord's church. And it's an organism because he makes it alive by his spirit. His spirit comes in, makes it alive, makes it function, makes it move. He animates it. He makes one part we had, you do this, and another part we had in our discussion this morning about, you know, the Lord told me to do stuff. And we were, we were you know, we were kind of having that discussion about what's that, what's that look like. Man, we don't listen to that enough. And I don't have time to go into all the details today, but Ephesians chapter 4, when it talks about apostles, let, let, me, let me just touch on this. It's not in my notes, so this is, this is free. <laughs> let me just read to you from my notes. Uh, verse 7 of chapter 4 says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay? Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now that's a kind of a quote from the Old Testament. In verse 9, in saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended in the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. All right, so you got a little parenthetic passage in there describing the one who is the giver of gifts and who is the minister of this grace. Let me go back to verse 7. Grace is given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, and then he goes on to talk about this whole process. And, and when that parent, parenthetical statement is over, he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds, and some teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up the body of Christ. Now, I'm, I'm actually questioning here what continues and what stopped. There are no more apostles who saw Jesus. They're all dead. And before they died, the ones who did wrote, and we have it here in our Bible. <clears throat> it is the unerring word of God. Not to be detracted from, not to be added to. How many are with me here so far? Those are pop. How many are not with me? How many aren't going to vote? All right, so guys, I need, you to, I need you to be with me here because we were talking earlier in an adult class. Most stuff today is done on feeling and there's very little thinking involved in it. Have you ever tried to get somebody to calm down by telling them to calm down? <laughs> It's the most use the two most useless words in the entire language. Are, Calm down. <laughs> you get someone emotionally stirred up and they don't listen to reason. And unfortunately, the Church of Jesus Christ has been teaching itself to function on emotion for generations instead of thought. So the apostles are gone. Those foundational people are gone, but that doesn't mean there are no more apostles or prophets. How come we can say there are no more apostles or prophets, but we don't say there are no pastors and teachers when they're in the context of the same sentence? Come here with me here. Say, well, what does a New Testament apostle look like? I'm not sure. I don't understand all this stuff. Seems like the only thing that we register here that we really like here are shepherds or pastors and teachers. And sometimes those are, by the way, some, some Bible scholars believe those are one word, one person. But that's what these are, they're people. And certainly, he says the reason they give him that still continues to equip the saints for the work of ministry, building up by Christ, that we all attain the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to measure of stature, 
fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by ways and carried about everywhere with the doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking truth and love, we are to grow up, everyone, into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, which is with which it is equipped, with each part is working, uh, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We're back to that again. So we got this. We got this wonderful organism, and and uh, we're supposed to be hearing from God, and we're supposed to be acting on what we hear from God in our relationship. We, you know, we say this every Sunday. We do an offering. We challenge you each week to seek God about what you're to do. We tell you that it's not a formula because we don't find that formula in the New Testament. They had all kinds of opportunities to share it, and they didn't. They said, they said we're to do everything we do to the glory of God. So we, we, we encourage you. We, we believe that now, because we're an organism, and because the Lord Jesus Christ dwells in us through the Holy Spirit, that he speaks to us inwardly and can tell us what we're to do. We're, we can take, you know... If you're a functioning believer in all, you apply this principle to the things you like to apply it to. If you're having a lot of stress with somebody, you're going to be praying. You're going to say, God, you know, please help me, give me wisdom, make them shut up, or give me grace. You know, what the, you're, going to, you're going to be praying, and you're going to be asking God. You're going to say, God, what do I do? You know, so what are you doing? You're asking God to show you what to do to deal with this difficult situation, whether it's a person or someone else. How many are following this? And yet we don't think that that relationship goes on to our giving or to other parts of our life. We just, we, we just pick and choose what we want. We have this dynamic relationship where God dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. That's what chapters 4, 5, and 6 are all about. And we're all supposed to be hearing and we're all supposed to be responding to what we hear so that the whole body, all of the joints of the body working together build itself up in love. And we're all encouraging and loving and caring and sometimes saying, no, I don't know about that. Maybe not in that manner. Probably not good to point the finger. I, I don't know what you're, I don't know if you should be doing that. <laughs> you know, don't, don't do that, you know. But find some way to broach the subject and, and hold people accountable and be accountable to others. My time is up. I haven't got my two main points. So, um, I, I don't have time to read these, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give them to you. Ah, man. Um, one of the key words in this letter is the word mystery, which appears seven times. It's in 1 9, 3 3, 3 4, 3 6, 3 9. It's in 5 32 and 6 19. Let me read to you just a. Actually, we read it already. He says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. So I don't know what the will of God is. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. We'll, we'll go there some other time. The mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things in earth. So this, what, what God is doing in his church, remember I said you're not just some little splinter group, some parochial little thing just gathering together. God is working in us his eternal purpose through Jesus Christ. I used to be involved in a, in a success program. Um, I, got, I even taught it. 
for a while. I quit teaching it. I didn't like teaching it and um, because it was off in, in some areas and I, I couldn't talk about God. And, and they had your life divided up, you know, in all of the all of the sections. And you had a family section over here and a job section over here and a hobby section over here and or maybe social over here, you know, and it was like a pie. And the problem with that is Spiritual was over here just like social. Spiritual's in the center, folks. Amen. Your relationship with God is in the center and all those other things. You know how you relate to your neighbors and your friends? That, that, that arises out of your relationship with God. Your finances and your job and your family and all the other things, they arise out of that hub that's in the center. Your relationship with God, it all comes out from there. That that's the mystery. And I don't have time to go through all these, but they're there. I hope, I hope you'll read them and look at them. Let me give you the verses again. 1-9, 3-3, 3-4, 3-6, 3-7, 3-8, 3-9, 3 and 6-19. Uh, it's, we're walking in this mystery. So I don't understand everything God's doing. Well, it's a mystery. And, and I don't have time to read it, but Paul says in one of these passages, he says this is the mystery that, that God is doing, and he's showing all of created, all the created beings out here. You know how many, how many of these created beings are there? What, a lot, yeah. <laughs> you know, one place it talks about an innumerable number. And that seems like an oxymoron to me. How do you have a number that's not a number? I don't know how that works, but there's a lot. He says, I'm, sh I'm showing my grace. This, this mystery that you're a part of is, is God showing his grace. And they're looking down and they're saying, what did you do? That guy was a liar. He lied to his wife. That guy was a thief. That guy is full of hatred. How did, how did you know what? What are you doing? And God says, watch my grace. Watch my grace work. Another important walk. We walk in a mystery. Some of our friends have tried to take away all the mysterious and build a theological base that has almost all the questions answered. But our God is an awesome God. There are things about him we cannot understand. When people saw him, actually, like Isaiah saw him, he, Isaiah says, I'm undone. John fell down as dead. Moses got in God's presence and he didn't even really, you know, the Bible says talk to God face to face. I think that's kind of a figure of speech because God said you can only see my, my hind parts, you know, the trail that's come along mine. And, and, and even with that, the people didn't like looking at Moses and they said, put something on your face, you're glowing. Do you understand that? I mean, we say, you know, well, she's pregnant, she's just glowing. I don't think it's the same thing. I don't think Moses was pregnant. <laughs> Remember last week I told you the story about the helicopter pilot? Remember this? Here's an interesting thing. As he was, and I told you how he came back to his base and they were all there waiting on him and they hugged him. And I related to that how we ought to be with our brothers and sisters. Let me tell you a mysterious thing. He was on his way back. He, he put his helmet on. He had his, he was a pilot. He put his, he was riding back to the base in one of their remaining helicopters and he had his flight helmet on. He plugged it into the system and he was listening to Armed Forces Radio. And he was thinking about all the things they'd gone through, two helicopters shot out from under him that day and all the other things that, that had gone on when he heard a voice say to him, his name was Jay, Jay, you're going to be okay. And he turned to look, 
See who said it. And found no one. Isn't that pretty interesting? And at that particular point on Armed Forces, on Armed Forces Radio Network, the, the, the people who were doing it actually mentioned the um, operation he was in and said, we heard you guys are going into some tough times. You've lost some people. We're going to play this in here. And, it, and they played Amazing Grace. So when this guy was telling this, he broke down and he sniffled for the next six or seven minutes in this interview. Want to hear the rest of the story? His mom wrote him a letter. And in the letter, she said, Jay, you're going to be okay. It was dated the same date of his experience. His mom woke up in the night and said to her husband, how do you know that? And woke him up. Guess what she thought her husband said to her? Jay's going to be okay. Now, um, they have the letter. Okay? I mean, you can say, oh, that's amazing. That stuff. God doesn't do that stuff anymore. Who are you to say what God doesn't do anymore? If it doesn't say that God doesn't do it in here, how do you know that God doesn't do it? There's a mystery, and we walk in it day by day. And I think so often our eyes are so clouded over with our own our own weaknesses, whether it's you know whether it's a sin weakness, our own struggles, our so our own hassles. We get wrapped up in that. We get wrapped up in the fact that we got to go to work because we got these kids that need clothes and shoes, and we're not allowed to let them run naked anymore. We gotta feed them, you know, so the authorities don't come. So we, we we're doing that, and, and we're we're all we're all wrapped up in all of this stuff that's going on around about us. Some of us are struggling for control and sex and money, and we forget that we're walking. We have this walk. Chapter two, verse one. He uses it, chapter 2, verse 10, chapter 4, verse 1. We already read one of those. Chapter 4, verse 17, chapters 5, 1 and 2, 5, 8, and 5, 15, all use the word walk. We're in a walk, and we walk in a mystery. Let me just read it real quick, and then we'll close. Chapter 2, verse 1. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked. Past tense. I don't have time to go to elaborate on it. Chapter uh, verse 10, we, we probably know. Uh, I think it's here in my Bible. There it is. Uh, verse 9, that is a result of works that no one should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. Chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, calling to which you've been called. Verse 17. Now I say that now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in folks, this is what I've been trying to tell you. The world lives in this area of darkness. There's no mystery. There's no wonder. They're just, they, they, there's no, no light out there that tells them things are going to get better. Darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because the ignorance is in them due to their hardness of heart. He says, don't you live that way. Chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice of uh, and a sacrifice to God. Chapter 5, verse 8. Walk as children of light. Let me read verse 7. Therefore do not become partners with them. At one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And he goes on to talk about it. I don't have time to read that, but you can read it. Chapter 5, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. 
making the best use of time. And we'll close there. And we we go a long time. We walk. Say, I don't want to walk. You ain't got no choice. You're walking it whether you want to be or not. You can walk in light, you can walk in love, you can walk with the Lord, you can shut the Lord all out and get all wrapped up in this life. And you say, well, I don't think that's possible for a believer to do, then why did Paul tell you not to do it? Paul said, don't live in the darkness you used to live in. You've got to keep walking. Keep right on walking, walking in the light of the Lord. You'll get to heaven someday if you walk the right way, walking in the light of the Lord. Some questionable theology in there, but I thought I'd tell you. <laughs> Stay with me if you will. You've got to keep walking, keep right on walking. Walking in the light of the Lord, you'll get to heaven someday if you walk the right way. Walking in the light of the Lord. Heavenly Father, like the old servant of old, open our eyes. That servant who couldn't see all of those angels and warriors around about the prophet. When his eyes were opened, the mystery became real to him. Open our eyes. Help us see that this walk of ours is not just from the time we're born to the time we die. We're in preparation now live with you forever and ever. Help us not think that our walk is meaningless and drudgery. Open our eyes to the mystery. Fill our walk with your love and your light. Fill our hearts with hymns and songs of your grace and Keep standing, if you will, and we'll sing a couple choruses. Um, 4.15.